So the slush pile has just got to hang out with the incredible Sally Gardner, and although we can't share all of the fabulous conversations we just had, we will share some of her event, in which she gets everyone to question just about everything. Can I just start by asking you exactly where Magic Mirror came from and what kind of drove you to explore this world? I was on a very strict diet, which I wouldn't recommend anyone going on, uh, where basically you could eat nothing except astronaut food. And I became angrier and angrier and angrier about the fact I could eat. And I sat down one day, everyone said I was impossible to live with, which I'm sure I was, and I sat down one day and I just started BANG! And this chap appeared called Standish, but I didn't have his name, and uh, I had him called all sorts of other things, and it just, they just really didn't fly. And I, until I found the name, and then someone came in and said, oh, I've just been up north, it was an extraordinary place called Standish Treadwell. Like you're joking, and that was the character. The minute I heard it, I knew that was it. Apparently, there is a place called Standish yeah. Treadwell, which I just. Anyone from there? Hi. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so that, and then I wrote it really very, very quickly. I wrote it within six weeks because this ridiculous diet nearly drove me bonkers. And it came faster and faster and faster. And then when it was finished, I. I was told to get off the duck, basically, that it was doing me no good. And um, I sort of put it away and thought, well, I'll just forget about it. Uh, and it, it was quite violent. And I had never written anything violent before, really violent. And I left it for about a year before I went back yeah. to it and rewrote it. And how different was it, that first one that sort of came out with you when you were so angry? Well, it had come out from all my research for Double Shadow. I'd been working on this book uh, based in between the two world wars. And uh, there, what really fascinated me was this what if history. Uh, yeah. This is really what came out of it, was the what if. And all of us in this room have what ifs to us, which makes our lives really fascinating. But one of the big what ifs was uh, Churchill. When Churchill was standing on Fifth Avenue, when it had just, he was late for a dinner party. He was a chubby man, as we all know, and he was late going. And he, forgotten that the road had become one way. And a taxi driver coming off duty, so sort of slightly sleepy, didn't see this man come out, and he hit him. If he'd gone two centimetres further into him, he'd be dead. And our history of our world would have been a different place. Well, you put that on top of another story, which is a young man called Hitler crossing a pedestrian crossing in Berlin, is hit by a, I think it's an Oxford student, um, in a Lamborghini, and uh, nearly runs him over. Now, it, it's just sort of riveting, what if. And then I sort of took that one step further, because everyone talks about the day when Britain was the second fire of London. It's when, it happens on 29th of December, if I've got my facts still right, 19. Uh, uh, 40, and it it happens, uh, they think it, it's going to happen, but they're not positive this will happen. And um, basically, London is blitzed, completely blitzed, and Churchill gives us one command, don't let um, St. Paul's go. And in point of fact, something like 1,500 incendiary devices fall on top of St. Paul's, and it is saved by people with their bare hands, lifting them off and throwing them down. But what really saves London, not only the amazing bravery of Londoners, but one extraordinary fact is the wind changed. And Goering decided not to send his pretty boys over because he didn't want his pretty boys to get killed. So he didn't send the last of the bombers. And if he had done, there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that London would have become a Dresden. Yeah. and uh, our history would have been completely different once again. So all these what-ifs really play into the thing. And the big what-if for me in this book mm. is what if we hadn't gone to the moon? And that became the big, the big thing. And I have no, I don't wish to say to anyone, I believe this or I don't have any belief about it at all. I think you've got to ask the question, and that's the main thing. And there is so much to do with the conspiracy theory. It's a what if, what if. But what would the consequence for the world have been? That's something that people don't ask because they'll talk about the conspiracy. There's masses of them. 
Um, I've used every single one of them. Um, but no one really asked the question, what would have happened to the whole, because actually, what does happen is America becomes the greatest country in the world, the biggest country in the world, and Russia loses coal. But if it hadn't happened, if it was the greatest hoax in the world, it would be, wouldn't that be ideal? I mean, the country of America comes up with the biggest hoax in the world. I think it's just riveting notion. Yeah. Fascinating. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And just from talking to you, it's like, just, just now, just... When you start thinking about what if, my goodness, it's the yeah the potential is enormous. For, yeah, it is enormous. How on earth, as a as a author, when you start asking that what if, how do you choose which what if to follow for your story or what if you um, want to explore? And, yeah, how how do you stop your mind just kind of? Well, it, that's really. I I was waiting actually for the edits to come back on Double Shadow. And it taken a long time, and I, as I've said, I was on this ridiculous diet, so my temper was not good at the first. So I was really tapping away, and I just sort of randomly had had a conversation with a friend of mine who said, do you think they did go to the moon? And it's like, yeah, yeah, of course. You know, I took no notice of the conversation. Then I went home and thought, hold on. And he was fascinated by this 11 mile of radiation, which I don't know if any of you have heard about, but this is a really sort of, it gets me this one. Apparently there's 11 miles of radiation around the moon, whether this is true or not, I'm, I'm no scientist. But it is true to note that none of the space shuttles have ever gone into the 11 mile of radiation. They've all stayed way back from it. And so what really interested me is apparently we went in to it in nothing more than an ironing board cover. Uh, basically yeah. when you go and look at this. Yeah. And I went to a wonderful exhibition in New York recently where they showed the oven glove that the moon rock was picked up with. Yeah. And it just looked literally like something you might use to pick up the turkey out of the oven. Oh yes, I'll just use this to pick up a moon rock. And I just loved all that. I just thought, wow, you yeah. know, this is a thing that looked like a tin can made of Heinz baked beans. And they actually went through 11 miles of radiation. And there's the other wonderful things. They all had these little cameras on them, which they had very big hand gloves, and they couldn't make them work on gravity. So suddenly they land on the moon and the pictures go shh, 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 And the next thing we see is absolutely amazing pictures that are zoomed back. And one of the astronauts says, this looks like Roswell. On one of the YouTube videos, he actually says it looks a bit like Roswell. Well, really, absolutely got me going. I think questions is everything. I just... So much of what we taught is propaganda, so much of what we do is propaganda. We've gone to question. It, it, it's the one great thing we have as human beings. The question is king. I always say this to kids. I say, the question is everything. The answer is totally immaterial. It's just another engine for another question. The world is unanswerable. That is the wonderful thing about it. You just keep asking the question. And I can't bear it when I see little kids going, why? And the mother goes, because I said so. I just think, oh. I feel like yeah. interfering immediately, going, no, 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 no. Yeah. <laughs> Don't believe it. Absolutely. Do you think, um, do you think we, are, we are brought up not asking enough questions? Yes, I do. Absolutely. I do. I think we accept far too many things. It's just a magical world. We should always be asking questions about it. OK, chapter one. I'm wondering what if. What if the football hadn't gone over the wall? What if Hector had never gone looking for it? What if he hadn't kept that dark secret to himself? What if? Then I suppose I'd be telling myself another story. You see, the what ifs are as boundless as the stars. Two. Miss Connolly, our old English teacher, always said start your story at the beginning. Make it a clean window for us to see through. Though I don't really think that's what she meant. No one, not even Miss Connolly, dares write what we see through that smear of glass. Best not to look out. If you have to, then best to keep quiet. I'd never be so daft as to write this down, not on paper. Even if I could, I couldn't. You see, I can't spell my own name. Standish Treadwell. Can't read. Can't write. Standish Treadwell isn't bright. <coughs> Miss Connolly was the only teacher ever to say that what makes Standish stand apart is he's an original. Hector smiled when I told him that. He said personally he'd clock that one straight away. Now train track thinkers, then there's you, Standish. 
a breeze in the park of imagination. I said that again to myself. Then there is Standish, with an imagination that breezes through the park, doesn't even see the benches, just notices that there is no dog shit where dog shit should be. I wasn't listening to the three. I wasn't listening to the lesson when the note arrived from the headmaster's office, because me and Hector were in the city across the water, in another country, where the buildings don't stop rising until they pin the clouds to the sky, where the sun shines in technicolor, life lived at the end of the rainbow. I don't care what they tell us, I've seen it on TV. They sing in the streets, they even sing in the rain, sing while dancing around lampposts. This is the dark ages, we don't sing. But this was the best dream, daydream I had had since Hector and his family vanished. Mostly I try not to think about Hector, Instead, I like to concentrate on imagining myself on our planet, the one Hector and I invented, Juniper. It was better than being worried sick about what had happened to him. Except this was one of the best daydreams I'd had for a long time. It felt as if Hector was near me again. We were driving around in one of those huge ice cream Cadillacs. I could almost smell the leather. Bright blue, sky blue, leather blue seat. Hector in the back. Me with my arm resting on the chrome of the wound down window and my hand on the wheel driving us home for Croca Colas in a shiny kitchen with a checkered tablecloth and a garden that looks as if the grass was hoovered. That's when I became vaguely aware of Mr. Gunnell saying my name. Standish Treadwell, you're wanted in the headmaster's office. Frick frackin' hell. I should have seen that coming. Mr. Gunnell's cane made my eyes smart hit me so hard on the back of the hand that he left two calling cards, two thin red wheels. Mr. Gunnell wasn't tall, but his muscles were made out of old army tanks with well-oiled army tank arms. He wore a toupee that had a life of its own, battling to stay stuck on top of his sweaty, shiny head. His other features didn't do him any favours. He had a small, dark, snot-marked moustache that went down to his mouth. He smiled only when using his cane, that smile curled the corners of his mouth, so his dried up leech of a tongue stuck out. Thinking about it, I'm not sure the word smile is right. Maybe it just twisted that way when he applied his mind to his favourite sport, hurting you. He wasn't that worried where the cane landed, as long as it hit flesh. Made you jump. You see, they only sing across the water. <coughs> Here the sky fell in long ago. Your leading character is obviously very complex and um, also obviously brings into the book and of something you feel very passionately about and that's dyslexia. Yeah. Um, can I ask where that passion and where that kind of passion to get that into your book came from? Well I am severely dyslexic but Standish is a character I've always wanted to do. I mean for a start this doesn't come difficult to me. Standish comes very easy to me um, and I think this is my way of thinking. Yeah. Um, and it, it's just a joy to be able to put him down for people to read him and actually for people to have come back and said how much they like Standish. And it's like, wow, yeah, you know. And so he, in a way, I don't think I could have written this book if I hadn't written yeah. several other books that have really nothing to touch on this subject. And also, I very much wanted, everyone who ever touches on dyslexia always does it with bad spelling. Mm -hmm. And dyslexia isn't about bad spelling. It, it's just like, the tip of an iceberg gone the wrong way. Um, that's not what sunk the Titanic. It isn't bad spelling, I can assure you of that. It's the way we see, it's visual, it's everything. And I, I just really wanted to get it out there because putting a character that just occasionally spells something wrong is like, oh, no. And it's usually always done by people who are perfectly good spellers. And it really makes you angry. You think, Look, you can all spell the dictionary. Why are you trying to spell it wrong? We can do that with no trouble at all. Yeah. But um, so I thought, no, I would do it with the way you spoke because I often say things wrong the wrong way. I, I was often when I, I still do it to this day. If I have a bad day, I can hardly get my own name up properly. I'm doing all right I tonight. Think, <laughs> I think it's um, as you say. I mean, there are um, moments within children's literature where people have tried to tackle it and. and and get it sort of discussed in the public arena and things. And it's, it is, it's a very refreshing way to tackle it. Um, and I, I think... Um, and I never say he is. No. That's the other thing. In this book, he's never diagnosed. 